Hi, everybody, and again, welcome back. We're so glad that you're here as we continue in our study on the life of Christ, one perfect life, as we are studying in the last half of the chapter 14 in the book of John. We see that Jesus is comforting his disciples as he is still in the upper room and he's teaching them before going to the Garden of Gethsemane and before he uh, goes to be judged and to the cross. And we see that at this time we've had to slow down our study because this is jam-packed full of important things for his disciples at that time and for his disciples today to understand. As we know, Jesus had several more teaching opportunities after he rose from the grave, but these were the critical things that were important for them to understand as one, they were preparing for the most tumultuous, most horrible, but yet most blessed days to ever face the earth. And that was the taking, the mock trial, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And he is teaching them the coveted truths that they must understand before they go through this incredible next 48 hours of incredible testing, just beyond anything that they could have imagined. But I want to encourage you to understand how our Father teaches. He doesn't give us all the details. He allows us to experience it firsthand as we go through trials. And in the midst of the trials, he reminds us to call upon him and he will reveal himself through the teachings of his word that have already uh, become something of knowledge, but they are not real to us until we experience them. And the best illustration I'm going to give you is in uh, any type of performance, whether it is athletics or playing an instrument, there is the educational part where you practice, 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 but you never really experience the wonder of what you know until you are in the trial, until you are in the competition, until you are in the event where you perform and act upon your knowledge and uh, leaving the illustration and going to the life of a disciple when you take the facts that you know from the word of god and you implement those in real life scenarios that is when you experience him and that is when you gain confidence because you know that what you have is real it becomes bigger than you and that's what Jesus is doing, his final preparations, as these next few days are going to be quite an experience for his disciples. So let's ask the Lord to bless. Father, we love you and we thank you that at this time you give us such great knowledge. And we pray that just as you were preparing your disciples, you will prepare us through the teachings of these lessons so that as we come into the trials, the temptations, the difficult days in our lives, we then too will recall the things you've taught us, implement it, and then experience your nearness. For these things, we are thankful. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, class, let's get started. John chapter 14. We are reading from the New King James Version, verse 15. If you love me, now remember, this is comforting. Remember the setting. They're still up in the upper room. They're, they've seen Judas leave, and he's saying that somebody is going to uh, betray me. And they're all wondering if it's going to be them. And he's in this last throes of instruction, and he says, if you love me, well, this is how you're going to know. Keep my commandments. Now, I'm sure that kind of scared him because anticipating keeping in commandments is a, is quite a challenge. But he says, if you love me, then keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. Jesus had to leave in order to make the way available for the Holy Ghost, the great comforter, 
the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost to come along and help. And the actual word that's used here is the parakletos, para as in parallel lines. He comes alongside you and he abides with you forever. Now, we're not saying that the Spirit of God was not among, on the earth. We know that the Spirit of God worked since the creation, but not in the same capacity that he began to work once Jesus left this world. Now, he's not talking about his death. He's not talking about his resurrection. He's talking about after he left, 50 days after he rose from the grave on the 50th day, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit come in a new capacity. We'll study that later on. So he says, I'm going to make a way for the Holy Ghost to come and start to work within you disciples. And he does within the believers today in a new experiential way, something that had never been experienced yet on earth. Verse 17, he is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because they're not born again, because they're not of God. You as a believer have something in you that the rest of the world does not have. That's why he explained that to John in chapter three, or I'm sorry, to Nicodemus in John chapter three, he said it's a born again experience because a new form of life, zoe, you know, man is born with bios, he is born with psyche, but he is born again when Zoe is interjected into his life. That's life eternal, that's life more intensified. And that spirit of life, the spirit of God, here referred to as the spirit of truth, is revealed to those who has received him. But the world cannot receive him because it neither sees him or knows him, meaning God the Trinity. But you know him, God the Father, through God the Son, and you will experience him in God the Spirit, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Oh my goodness, God in the form of a spirit dwells in his believer and you are part of him. He says, even though I'm leaving you, verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. You will not be left alone. I will come to you, but I will come to you in spirit. Once again, when he's talking about the three persons of God, sometimes he breaks it down. He talks about the individual personalities or persons of God, but they're all three one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are all one God. So God leaves them in one form, a human form, for something better to come back to them in the spirit form. Now, we've been speaking thus far in the chapter since verse 1 about Jesus' comforting. But, but here he takes the next step. And I title it, Since Jesus is Comforting, he now finds it the appropriate time to remind them, obey, obey. If you're one of mine, obey, and I'll make it possible for you to obey. Verse 19, a little while longer and the world will see me no more. I won't be walking about this earth forever. Just a matter of days and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. You will see me. Because I live, you will live also. And at that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Now, what he's talking about there, he's pointing toward Pentecost. You will then know when the Spirit Spirit of God comes upon you. The third person of the Godhead comes upon you. You're going to know these things that I've been telling you did come true exactly the way I explained them. And when you experience me again in the Spirit, God is speaking, you've known me as the Father, Creator, God, 
uh, the, the Jehovah God of Israel. You've watched me for over three years and you've experienced me in that human relationship. But when you experience me in that new yet to come spiritual relationship, you're going to then fully experience and know. You're going to know that you're part of something so much bigger because I live through the spirit. You will live also through the Spirit and never die. At that day when the Spirit indwells you, you will know these things that I've been saying, that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you, we're all together one family. For that reason, again, when you experience that, there's no excuses. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. So he gives you this test, not as a way to work your way to heaven or to prove your worth to him. You can't prove your worth to him. But he gives you this formula to experience him so that you will know and believe in something that is outside of this world. It's supernatural. It is not of this world at all. When you begin to have the ability to honor him and on a regular basis keep his commandments, you will know I really do love him. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. What a promise. And I will love him and, here's the best part, and manifest myself to him. Now, believer, that's what's going on in your life. As you continue to grow and, and further surrender and as you continue to grow and be more devoted after years. Now, I say after decades of faithfulness and you continue to grow in him, he begins to reveal himself to you and, his, and your confidence begins to increase and improve. And it's something that a, a young person in Christ can never do. It only comes with time. But as you have this time, he has become so manifest in you that you could never deny him. You wouldn't want to try to deny him. And you have a testimony to the world that cannot be shaken because God is living and revealing himself through you to others. He manifests himself in you. Well, up through verse 21, that's a powerful message. And Judas hasn't experienced this yet. So he gives us this recording so that that way you and I can have it to benefit from as well. But Judas says, now back up. Now, this is not Judas Iscariot. This is the other Judas, a, a true disciple. He said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? How is it that you're making this distinction between your true disciples and the non-disciples? Verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. While you're still here on earth, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit will make their home with him. You see, well, that's why it's so foreign. It's so it's so um, odd. Uh, there's five warnings in the book of Hebrews. And the fifth warning says it makes no sense for a person to have this knowledge exposed to him, to be have this revealed to him. And he continues to 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 serve the world. It, it makes no sense to have the true Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost to be manifested to that person, but yet they desire sin. They desire worldly things. That doesn't make any sense. Well, he tells us that because it's not possible. And you're going, no, wait, Pastor, you're scaring me here. I mean, I, I don't like it when you talk like that. What do you mean it's not possible? Because I love those things. What well, do you see how weird that is? How weird that is to still love things that are not of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. When you see this passage revealed to you, you're going, snap out of it. Quit, quit being deceived by the, the ruler of this world. He's a liar. He's a, he's a hoaxer. He's a trick. He wants to not only shut you up. He knows he can't take away your salvation, but he wants to get you to shut up because he wants your children. He wants your grandchildren. The last thing he wants is for you to have a powerful manifestation of God revealed through yourself so that you or your friends and your family members will come to have a walking testimony. And he's saying that's what, that's what the true believer looks and sounds like. 
now that you know, it's not a secret. So don't be shy. Dig deeper into God's word. Become real. Challenge those around you to, to become more real, to become more invested in his ministry, to become more involved in his church. And that way the world will know you're not of this world. You're of him. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Now he's saying, obey the written words that I've given you. Obey the Bible. Study the Bible. Learn the Bible. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now you see, home doesn't mean I just hang around. Home is where family invest in one another and they enjoy each other's presence. True relationship. In contrast, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear, it's not me, it's not mine, but it's the Father who sent me is giving you this warning or source of encouragement. You get to decide which one it is. How about it for you? Is it a warning? Is it a scare? Or is it a sense of encouragement? Well, if you're in this study, I'm, I am assuming that you love and believe in Jesus Christ. The question is, is, where are you on your growth path? And if you're disappointed and a little bit scared because you've just had too many years that you've been languishing or, or wasting, well, then it should be a, you know, an encouragement or <laughs> a good coach would say a kick in the pants and say, get with the program and let's go because it is well worth the journey. He deserves our best. And that's where your real joy is going to be. Don't let the imposter uh, fool you anymore. He's he's lying to you. Um, I, I hate it whenever there's somebody who markets a product and then when you really get the product, it's not at all as valuable as what they pretended it to be. I, I resent that predatory marketing approach. Well, that's Satan. He's preying upon you and he's telling you lies. But once you really taste it, once you get it and try it out for a while, the things of this world are very undesirable. So Jesus goes on to teach about how he's going to send the great comforter. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Now, listen, God is the ultimate teacher and the way that he uses the spirit to communicate to our spirit in dwelling within us is a very intimate and a very effective thing. He's teaching you if you're listening, if you're looking, if you're striving to be holy, separated from the things of this world, he's teaching you. And, you know, some people say, you know, I'm not really good at memorizing scripture. Look, just try. It's not that you're competing with somebody else and how much you can memorize. It's just try because as you're digesting God's word, the spirit of God is moving and teaching and revealing things to you. And then at the right time, when you need the right words, when you need the right uh, nudge in certain situations, sometimes a nudge means to be bold and step up. Sometimes a nudge means be still. Be still. He will bring to remembrance the things that you have read from his book, the things you have learned through the foolishness of preaching God's word. 27. Well, this has got to be the most comforting. As a result of those who love him and are obedient with him, and they have this growing intimate relationship with the Spirit of God within them 24-7, even while you're sleeping, he doesn't sleep. Then you get, verse 27, peace. So he says, as he's getting ready to go on to the most horrific thing that has ever happened since the beginning of creation, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace, just before I'm about to be taken, um, just hours before uh, Peter is going to cut off a guy's ear, just hours before Jesus is going to be chained, shackled, and drug away, just hours before they're going to cloak his head and begin to 
to hit him, pummel him in the face and tease with him and say, if you're God, tell us which one hit you. He says, peace, I'm leaving with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Can you believe these are the words he's saying as he knows what's about to happen? You have heard me say to you, I am going away and I'm coming back to you. Now, he's not talking about the resurrection. He's not talking about walking around with them off and on for 40 days. He's talking about when he comes back from heaven. He says, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father for my Father is greater than I. What he's saying is, is right now as you're speaking to me, I'm praying on your behalf. But when I'm right there at the right hand of the Father advocating for you and he is more powerful than I, not that he's making a comparison. What he's saying is, is that is where the the originating thoughts of God comes from. And our advocate Christ is right there with the originating Father. And they're right there together. And it just makes more sense. There's more he can do for us as an advocate in heaven and a comforter down here. So that's where the peace should be. And you should say, leaving here and going back to the Father uh, and, and advocating on our behalf up there, that would be a better thing. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. They are now getting an even more direct access to the throne of God while they're still here on earth. I like the way he ends this chapter. He's saying, now look, I'm telling you these things before they happen so that when you see them happen, You're going to say, oh, yeah, that's just like Jesus said. So every other thing I've said is just as real as the prophecies that I've been foretelling. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. There's nothing to do with me. And he is the ruler, the prince of the power of the air. For a temporary period of time, he's been given domain over this earth. Why? Because man chose to sin. Adam chose to sin. This is the the resulting curse. This is the consequence for the decision of sin. But it's only for a season, and the season will pass, and it's getting closer to being at the end. So the temporary ruler of this world, he's coming. He's coming to get Jesus. So they can't really talk much longer. It's it's teaching time is over. Now it's time for action as Jesus is availing himself. He's going someplace where they will be comfortable with taking him prisoner for the trial. So he says it's time it's time to go. And he has nothing to do with me, meaning that Satan is being used in this plan, but he's not of God. Verse thirty one but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Look at the last lesson he teaches in the upper room. He says, I am obedient unto the Father, and I do this as an example to you, that you too, in every situation, will be obedient unto the Father. And he closes by saying, Now that I've given you all the foreknowledge that you need so that when you see these things come to pass, you will know how real and how accurate and how very near that I am. Well, you and I can learn that same lesson. He says, class is over. Now it's time for the action to begin. Arise, let us go from here. And they left the upper room. Oh, where do we go next? My goodness, as as they consider all of the things that Jesus has been teaching them, um, we go to a, a text next that is about the vine and the branch. And, and I, I'm mentioning it now because there's great controversy about what John chapter 15 stands for, about what does it really mean to abide in Jesus Christ? What does it mean to abide in the Father? What does it mean for a branch 
to abide and you know whether you're abiding or not based upon whether you bear fruit. And then the real question, what's at stake here? Is he saying that all the branches that's on this vine are all sons of God, just some produce more than others and some there's still branches, but they don't produce. What was he talking about in John 14? Go back and become familiar with the context because I'm telling you that this is a narrow message. It's a narrow message that says, if you love me, you'll do my commandments. Well, if you do his commandments, if you follow his, his commandments, you will produce fruit. So if you don't produce fruit, then you're not following the commandments. If you're not following the commandments in chapter 14, if you run this formula in reverse, it's fair to say you don't love him. If you don't love him, you're not of him. If you're not of him, you're not a child of the king. I don't think it's a stretch to apply it this way. Now, I realize that rendering is not very popular and most people disagree with that rendering. But I just lay the challenge out before you and you decide, you read it and you you decide what the tone is. All right. Well, that's enough for this lesson. It's been a great time to be with you. So thankful for your faithfulness in this class. Um, I trust that you will meditate upon these words and that God will richly bless you. And until next time, honor the king. Amen. See you next time.